What's up, everybody? Today we're going to be talking about plain old HTML. And I get it, you learned this many years ago, but I bet you haven't quite been keeping up on it. So today I have for you six newish HTML tags that you either didn't know existed or you forgot about. Let's get started. Let's start off with an easy one, the article tag. Now, you'd be forgiven for assuming that it is uh, specifically for things like blog posts. And you're partially right. Yes, it would make sense for a blog post, but it's not limited to that. Okay, so here's the deal. The article tag represents a piece of independent content that you could potentially link to. And that last part is the key. Is this something that I might want to link to? Well, would you link to a blog post? Absolutely, of course. But what about things like uh, comments on a blog post? Would you ever link to a specific comment? Absolutely. So that too could be within an article tag. Uh, what about things like form threads or form replies? The exact same thing. What about things like uh, news uh, excerpts or, or news items? Could you link to that? Absolutely. So you would reach for the article tag. Or another way to think of it is if I were to grab this section here and move it elsewhere, would it still mostly make sense? And the answer is yes. So if you wanna switch over to this, yeah, maybe in your own project, you're wrapping your blog posts or your comments within a div. It's as simple as switching it over to article and you should be good to go. Okay, nice and easy, just how I like it. Let's move on to the next one. Let's talk about data list. Now the data list, Think of that as a, a native browser way to provide a sort of auto-completion. I'll show you an example. Uh, let's say you have an input here uh, that expects a person's username that you're going to mention or something like that. So we'll say placeholder, which username? Let's have a look in the browser. And of course, here's what we get. But if I type into it, there's no auto-completion because we haven't hooked it up to any data set or any data list. All right, let's do that now data list, and think of this almost like a select. You can provide options to it. So we'll do Jack, and I'll make this self-closing, and we'll do four. How about Sarah, James, and Sasha? Okay, well now, once again, if I switch back, nothing is gonna happen here because we haven't hooked up this data list to the input. We can do that by applying an ID, and we'll call it usernames, and then on the input, I can use the list attribute like so. Okay, so now I've created a connection between this data list and this input. So if I switch back and give it a refresh, yeah, now notice I have auto completion. Useful. And if we were to take a look in say Chrome, each browser has its own UI. So you can see in this case, we have a little arrow here. And if I click on it, it's slightly different, but they both do the exact same thing. And of course, Safari is going to be uh, pretty similar as well. So yeah, nice and easy to use. It can reduce errors and things like that. And of course, if you're using a server-side framework, you would probably populate those options uh, dynamically. All right, very cool. And once again, easy to use. Next up, let's have a look at the details tag. Now, the details tag uh, offers a way to toggle uh, a result or some piece of text. You've probably done this manually many times where you build an FAQ section that has a lot of questions. And when you click on each question, the answer uh, slides down below. Well, now you can do this natively using the details tag. I'll show you how. We'll have our details tag. We will use the summary tag for what is effectively the heading. How long are you open? And then your answer can be below it. We are open 24 hours a day. Okay, let's have a look in the browser. And here we go. So notice by default, the answer is hidden. But if I click on this, we toggle it. And it didn't require any JavaScript or any CSS, which is pretty cool. And yeah, you'll find the presentation here is almost identical from Firefox to Safari to Chrome. But of course, you can style it however you want to. So in fact, the summary is almost treated like a list item, which means you could use things like list style type to configure uh, whether we have a triangle or uh, one of these other symbols. As I scroll through these, you can have a look. You could do that, or you could even use something like list style image uh, to link to an image. In this case, I'll just do a quick linear gradient. That's gonna look <laughs> horrible, uh, but you get the idea. The whole point is you can style this however you want. Or maybe you decide, let's not show 
uh, any arrow at all. And then on the details tag, maybe you have a width of 400 pixels, set margins to auto, a background color of grayish, a little padding, you get the idea. And then we can toggle that uh, however we need to. Pretty cool. So yeah, maybe if you were building an FAQ section, well, that could be an article. We'd have FAQ, and that would consist of a series of details tags. So let's do another one. Um, why didn't Marty grab the gas from Doc's time machine and back to the future uh, three? And the answer of course is because it's a movie. Yeah, have you ever thought about that? So in Back to the Future 3, Marty goes back to save Doc, right? Doc gets sent back to 1885. So Marty gets in the time machine in 1955, and he goes back to 1985. And then something happens where he loses all of the gas. And that's the whole crux of the movie, right? They don't have gas to get back to 1985, so they have to find some way to get the time machine to go that fast. But Doc got sent back to 1885, so there would technically be two time machines at that point, right? the one that Marty went back in time um, in, and then the one that Doc got sent back in time. So just grab the gas from Doc's version of the time machine, right? It makes, am I missing something here? I always wondered about that. Uh, but anyways, if we come back and take a look, here we go. We have our FAQ section that looks probably pretty similar to the ones that you've built in the past. But now you get it for free natively in the browser and it doesn't require a lick of JavaScript or CSS. Pretty cool and easy to use. All right, what's up next? How about the dialog element? So dialogues are effectively a native solution to things like modals. And modals can always be a little tricky to create on your own. Uh, but now, if you want, you can have it for free. Let's see how. I'm going to create a dialog here. And we'll say something like, are you sure about that? And then maybe you have a section for buttons, yes and then another one for cancel. But yeah, if we were to have a look in the browser, I'm not gonna see anything here. And that's because of course, by default, a dialog is hidden. So once again, if you want to force it to show, we can add the open attribute, come back. Oh, and by the way, uh, on the details tag, I'm going a little quickly. If you want them to be open as well, then you could add the open attribute there. Okay, anyways, back to dialog. Um, so yeah, if we want this to show by default, we can add open. And if I switch back, now we see it. And again, it's not the prettiest thing, uh, but of course you can style this however you need to. So if you wanna tweak it, maybe one pixel and a slightly uh, lighter shade of black, you want that to be a border radius of 12 pixels, um, you wanna reset the padding. Again, you can do whatever you want to, uh, to make it look good. Okay. So now though, uh, what about styling the backdrop for the dialogue? Well, as it turns out, you can do things like this backdrop and maybe set a background color of um, you know black and 60% opacity. Uh, but if I switch back, we're not gonna see it here. And this is actually kind of a, a confusing one. So as it turns out, the backdrop styling will only take effect if you programmatically call um, the show modal method on the dialogue element. So here's what I mean. If I were to, uh, let's do this. Let's remove that so it's hidden. And now a uh, little tip, if you ever wanna grab the element, uh, a particular element, select it, and then use dollar sign zero. And now I have a reference to that DOM element. And yeah, if I were to manually call a show modal method, notice that it does um, display the styling for the backdrop, but it won't display it if you manually force it to be open. Uh, or you use something like Alpine.js to to control whether this is open, you know, something like something like that. That will not trigger the styling here, which I find confusing. But I'm sure there's a good reason for it. So if we wanted to make that work, um, yeah, I talked about Alpine. Let's do this. Even if you're not familiar with Alpine, it's so easy to use that you can figure it out in five seconds. So I'm going to pull in that library. And let's do this. Let's say we have some kind of section uh, where we have maybe a button to, um, I don't know, proceed with some kind of action. And when you click on that, we want to confirm that they want to proceed. Are you sure about that? Yes, cancel. Okay, well, of course, right now, um, if we take a look and I click on the button, nothing happens, of course, because yet again, we have not wired up the button to this dialogue. 
So we're gonna do that programmatically. I've pulled in Alpine.js, so I can declare this as an Alpine component of sorts by using the xData attribute. And then I can do things like this. I can listen for when a button is clicked using the at symbol. I can say alert clicked, uh, just to show you how easy this is to use. So what I wanna do here is say, well, when you click on this button, I want to show the dialog. So the long form way would be to use a simple uh, query selector. I'll be generic here. Grab the dialog and then call show modal. Uh, and that should do the trick. Proceed and it works. And I do get the backdrop styling, which is great. And then for cancel, yeah, again, this is super long, but if you wanted to cancel, you could say click and then I could uh, close the dialog. So proceed, close, proceed, close. Uh, and that would work. But of course, because in this case, I'm using Alpine.js, there are little shorthands. For example, if I want a quick reference to this DOM element, I could add a ref and we'll call it dialog. Now I could replace all of this with uh, using Alpine, give me your refs and specifically the one called dialog. Uh, and that again, will give us a reference to this element. And that should work as well. Pretty cool native dialogues in the browser. Let's have a look in Chrome. So in Chrome, yep, pretty much what you'd expect. And then for Safari, here we go, proceed. And yeah, basically the exact same thing. So yet again, notice how these HTML tags are almost like little controls that replace what in the past would have required a decent amount of JavaScript to provide, which is very cool. Okay, uh, what do we have? Two more here. Let's switch over to the figure tag. Now, the figure tag is traditionally used to wrap an image that could potentially have some kind of uh, caption associated with it. So an image and then a description describing what's happening in the image, and that's very common. So that would take the shape of something like this. Uh, let's use a service called, what is it? Pixum.photos. We'll grab a 400 by 400 photo. And then I'm gonna use this fig caption tag to describe whatever this random photo happens to be. Some random photo that I can't describe. <laughs> and let's have a look in the browser. All right, and here's what we get. So now notice the figure wraps both the image and the caption, which means we can style it uh, however we need to. For example, I could say text align to the center the caption itself maybe could be italic, a little margin on top, uh, you get the idea. It's an easy way um, to add a caption to an image. But here's the thing, the figure tag is not exclusively for wrapping images. Really, it's just meant to wrap some kind of self-contained unit is maybe the, the jargony way they might refer to it, a self-contained uh, unit or piece of content that could possibly or potentially have a caption associated with it. So what would be some other examples off the top of your head that we could do? Um, what about um, a code snippet? So something like this, name equals Jeff. Now, of course, I'm not going to have um, syntax highlighting for it, but this would be a use case where you could wrap it within a figure. And then if you want to add a fig caption at the top, maybe that could simply be the name of the file or some kind of description of what you're showing within that code snippet. That would be fine. And if we switch back, there you go. You add your code highlighting and uh, you're off to the races. Another example might be uh, a block quote. So let's say you have some kind of block quote uh, to be or not to be. And again, you want to maybe cite who is responsible for that. I don't know, is it Shakespeare, Hamlet? I, I really have no idea. But once again, we could wrap that within a figure tag and then add the fig caption. Uh, we'll just say Shakespeare. Okay, anyways, this would be uh, perfectly fine as well. So we have three different use cases, but not only three cases uh, where the figure tag would be perfectly appropriate. Let's move on to, what do we have? One more, we're at the end. We're gonna finish up with the picture tag. Now, the picture tag is useful for responsive design. So imagine situations where the image you want to provide to the user will vary dependent upon their environment. Uh, if they're on a phone, you want a slightly smaller image. If they're on a big widescreen uh, monitor, maybe you want to load something a little, a little heavier, a little more taxing. The picture tag allows you to do that 
uh, without loading each version of the image. I'll show you. Let's say here, uh, let's start out with a default. So we'll say once again, pick some photos and we will default to 100 by 100. All right, let's have a look in the browser. And of course we have our default image. And this in fact is what will be used if the browser doesn't understand the picture tag. At this point, they almost all do. But if you happen to be on a very old browser um, and it doesn't know what picture is, it will simply ignore it and load the image. Next, I can add any number of source tags. And this will consist of a couple attributes. First, the path to this image we're using, but we actually need to use source set. And that's because what you provide here could be a little more complex than just a simple path. Uh, but we're gonna keep it nice and easy for now. Okay, so we have a source that points to an image that's 400 by 400. But now we need to tell it the condition for whether or not this is the appropriate image to load. We can do that by adding the media attributes. And I could use a simple CSS selector here, like minimum width is uh, 1024 pixels. And now if we switch back to the browser, sure enough, we have a 400 pixel image because this condition effectively returned true. All right, let's do another one. And this can be whatever you want. How about maximum width is uh, 728 pixels. In that case, we load maybe a 200 pixel image. Okay, let's see what we have. So we have on my larger screen, we have a 400 pixel image. Uh, now we have, what is this? The 100 pixel image because it's greater than 726. But if we bring it a little lower, it increases, which again, doesn't quite make sense, but it's just to show you uh, when different images are being loaded. And here's the key thing uh, to focus on. If we give this a refresh, notice that we loaded the 200 pixel image and not the other two. We didn't load the 400 pixel or the 100 pixel. But if we tweak this a little bit, where is it? There we go. Only when that condition changes to true do we load the 100 pixel image. And then if we keep going, one more, there we go. Then it loads the 400 pixel image. So that's what I mean when I say this is especially useful for responsive design because it allows us to serve only the image that is required for that user's device. And they don't have to load a really large image that they won't benefit from. All right, and that does it. So we've now gone through six HTML tags that you either forgot about or you never knew existed in the first place.